Hey, welcome in everybody. I am Joe Borick from Sports Fanatic News, and we are joined by a very special guest today, John from Off the Wall Hockey. How are you doing today, John? I'm good, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Glad to be here and uh, ready to talk some hockey for sure. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely both always ready to talk some hockey, and this has been obviously an interesting offseason for sure going on in the COVID era. We still have many free agents on the market that we'll get to at the end of the video, and a lot of interesting placements of certain players, uh, to say the least. So that's what we're um, start with an interesting point um, to break us in, which is I saw an article this morning written by Brandon Moran on SCORE, which is our biggest surprises of the offseason. And the one, one of them that he labeled was Niskanen calls it quits. The other was Taylor Hall landing in Buffalo. Poole Jarvie returning to Edmonton, uh, which if you actually read into that, I didn't think it was as big of a surprise. But yeah. no, nah, that's not here nor there. Blue snag Krug. And then Canadians give Anderson the big bucks. Uh, so that is, again, written by Brandon Moran. He's a pretty good, not a pretty good writer. He's actually a really good writer for the score. I enjoy his stuff, so check him out, people. But uh, what do you think's the biggest surprise out of those things, John? Uh, for me, it was Matt Niskanen retiring. I, I did not see that coming at all. Niskanen was, I mean, still a top pair guy for the Flyers. He played with Provorov. Um, he still looked like he had another two, three, four years of really good hockey in him. And, and for him to just out of nowhere, just call it quits like that. That was the one that caught me by surprise the most. I did not expect that at all. No, uh, either did I obviously knowing, uh, I'm a Flyers fan. So, uh, when we saw Niskan retired, I was one of those people because sometimes you know how people want to go out on their own destiny sometimes. Mm -hmm. Niskanen already had a good career, so I was thinking maybe after his contract expired, which would have been after this calendar season, mm -hmm. he would say, okay, I already accomplished everything I want to accomplish. I mentored guys in the latter years of my career. I can move on. I was surprised he gave up the final year of money a lot, too, where if he wanted to retire soon, I was just surprised he didn't come back for the final year of his contract and then make that decision after next season. That, But I guess it was just you want to go out on a high note and you want to go out on your own terms. But uh, that's also a wonder of, say, somebody has a lot of injuries next year. Going out that young, it's a wonder if you're someone that's going to get called up like, hey, uh, we have a lot of injuries. Would you mind coming back for half a season? So that'll be interesting to see if that happens down the line. Um, especially with this condensed season, there probably, unfortunately, will be a few more injuries this season. Mm -hmm. But uh, since you went with the Niskanen one, mine, honestly, uh, mine's going to be, I think it has to be uh, Anderson, because, I mean, I like Josh Anderson. I've always liked Josh Anderson. He's a player that plays with a lot of grit and a lot of tenacity to his game that also has some skill, which are very fun players to watch in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. They're players you need. But when a guy's been banged up the last couple years, and then you just come in and shell out that much money, I mean, you gave him a seven-year deal worth $38.5 million. So yeah. that's really banking on his... Um, play there and if he's able to pull it out you look like geniuses because you now have him in that core who's a great guy to have in the playoffs you have Gallagher who everyone knows is already a great playoff uh, player so I think that would work out if he stays healthy it's just I never seen anybody get a seven-year contract that's had health concerns like Josh Anderson before that's why uh, that's the most surprising thing for me yeah, I completely agree. That was gonna. That was the next one on my list was Anderson getting that kind of contract. I mean, this is a guy who hasn't been healthy and hasn't been able to stay healthy at the NHL level at all over the past couple of years. And for, to give a guy like that a seven-year deal is just insane. This is Mark Bergevin, and it is the Montreal Canadiens. So I, I guess they they're not afraid to do things like this. But for for 
the injury history there, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Josh Anderson. I love just those kinds of players. So that Same style thing. of hockey is one of my absolute, f- those are my favorite guys to watch. And, you know, if, if you think back to what Josh Anderson could possibly become, if he, if he turns into, if he turns into think of like a Wayne Simmons type player when he was with the Flyers, when he was in the peak of his career, a guy that can give you 25, 30 goals, you know, 50 plus points and also play that physical style of hockey, then this contract will be worth it for, for Montreal. But it's such a risk with the injury history there. And what are the chances of him being able to become that player if he's missing significant time every single season because he can't stay healthy? And now you're locked into that for seven years. That That's just, it's a wild contract. I would have never offered a contract like that to, to a player with that kind of injury issues, but Montreal's going for it. And uh, if it works out, then I think that could be a huge boost to their forward group for sure. Oh, yeah, they're definitely going for it because as our next topic is uh, talking about moves we like in off seasons in general, they, of course, also brought in Allen, who's from that area, to be Price's uh, backup. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of comfortability there already. Mm -hmm. And in this condensed season, you definitely need that two goalie set to be able to take you over the hump because of the way our season's going to be next year. So I agree. Montreal is definitely going for it. Uh, it's just they're putting their eggs in baskets that are somewhat risky. So you have to see if it uh, pans out or if it bites them. Because Jake Allen also is coming off of a very good year. Prior to that, the year they won the Cup, they were, of course, carried by Bennington. And Allen was like a league average backup. Yeah. Uh, so, like, he really bounced back last year. So you got to see if he also stays at this 1B level or kind of goes back down yeah. to where he was before. So that's also a question that remains to be seen. I have always liked Jake Allen and hope he stays as good as he keeps playing because he's always been one of those seem-to-be-humble goalies that basically the opposite of Jordan Bennington is mm-hmm. what Jake Allen is, where Bennington's a showboat-type guy. Uh, that's not Jake Allen at all. Um, so, but moving on uh, from that, uh, for you, what's a move – that you think is an underrated move of the offseason of like a signee or a trade? Do you go and look at, wow, that might actually make a bigger impact than people are talking about? Uh, this one, I've been I've been talking about this move all offseason long. Kyle Turris to the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, Turris had an abysmal tenure with the Nashville Predators. He and that he did not fit in Nashville. He did not fit with their style of play, their system. He did not fit with that lineup. He things did not go well for Kyle Turris with Nashville. But if you go back a few years and look at the Kyle Turris that was playing in Ottawa, this was a guy who could certainly bring you 50 plus to 60 plus points per season with the Senators and could be a second line player. Um, if if he gets back to any semblance of that with the Edmonton Oilers, and I think there's there's a chance that he could, given that lineup and the amount of offensive help that he'll have around him in that lineup, uh, that could be an absolute steal of a contract for for the Edmonton Oilers because they own, they gave him less than two million a year for a guy that was making eight like eight million a year on his last contract. So. You you already have that one-two punch down the middle of McDavid and Dry Saddle. Turris can come in and be your third line center, and that allows Nugent Hopkins to play on the wing with Dry Saddle, where he was m- for most of last year. And it gives you a legitimate third line center who can score and put up some points, or he can play the wing as well. And if you want to put him up there and, and try him in the top six on somebody's wing, then you could do that too. He's a versatile player. I think he's going to fit in well with Edmonton. I think they play that fast paced offensive style of game that's going to lead to him scoring a lot more points than he did in Nashville. And, and I think the fit is just so much better. And it's a completely low risk move. It's a you know two year low money contract. If he if Kyle Turris can at all get back to the 40 to 50 point player that I think he still can be, then that's going to be a great deal for the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, that's a very good one. It's going to be odd uh, on this one because we both have uh, 
people going to Edmonton. So Steve's really going to like this uh, <laughs> video uh, when when he sees it. Um, but yeah, I agree with that because that also allows them to allow Nugent Hopkins, who they had to keep moving back to three C mm -hmm. due to the inability of other that role last season to be on the wing and really provide those top two juggernaut lines yep. that they can have and then have Torres and other good players at three and four. So that really does allow everything to fall into place. And then you kind of Jesse Pujarvi coming back too, um, as we mentioned, is one of the things that that guy considered a surprise. I mean, that, that kind of, and then if you really – read into it and paid attention to foreign stuff they were kind of talking about that throughout that he could come back but yeah he's a swiss army guy where you want to play him in your lineup too because you would think he might start on the third line since he's just coming back but he's also a quicker player with skill and we see how good a guy like connor sheary who has less skill than Pujarvi, does playing up mm -hmm. so they could play him up on the second or first line and see what happens there so that'll be interesting that isn't my uh, underrated thing, though, because technically he was still part of their team and just yep. fled to, uh, overseas for a couple years. Um, but my underrated pickup for them is Tyson Barry because he plays significantly better in the West. He's a great power play addition, which uh, they really need because you got Oscar Clefbaum, but Clefbaum um, is going to be out for all of – this year or pretty much most of it if he's not out for all of it so mm -hmm. uh you got caleb jones who i think is really going to emerge this year ethan bear is well basically his last name um <laughs> that so and then you have a uh, darnell nurse and then adam larson of course is a pretty good stay-at-home defensive defenseman the reason he gets knocked is because of the trade it's not because he's bad or anything is because of that that was one of the worst trades in hockey history yeah. um but barry i think is going to do really well i was surprised how high when i was reading the hockey news magazine i get for the um hockey the the draft guys when they predict stats they had him as one of the better um offensive production guys this year now that he's in edmonton I could definitely see him at least getting mid 40s. I think they had him like in the 50s or something, but I could definitely see him getting like that 45 per mm -hmm. points season in Edmonton because a guy that can move the puck up the ice with his ability with those offensive players. And they also added another good rated guy is Tyler Ennis, who can keep up with their pack, has been really improving, bouncing back his career the last two seasons. So uh, having all these good small additions. The Oilers are finally getting smart and picking up these good small players and not a bunch of people that are tough but slow as molasses so mm -hmm. they can't keep up with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Like, for example, Alex Chason. No offense to Alex Chason, but he can't keep up with anybody on the top two lines. That's why he needs to move down to the bottom yeah. two lines. So uh, that's just the nature of the beast. But... Now that uh, we went over our underrated um, signees, who do you think was the most um, – actually, before we do our most spot on, I guess we should pick on teams uh, first. <laughs> uh, who do you think uh, – so we'll start with uh, who was the most surprise signing you had that you think was actually not a good move for that team or three? Oh, man. There – I uh... – there's there's a few that fall under this category, but the one that that I'm I'm not really big on that a lot of other people are big on is um, Chris Tanev going to the Calgary Flames. I mean T Tanev Tanev is a s decent defenseman, but he has had some injury issues. He he's 30 years old now. He I don't he's not going to get any better than what he is. Um, and the, they lost T.J. Brody. Obviously, he left in free agency. Tanev is a downgrade from T.J. Brody. And, and a lot of people have been talking about Calgary's offseason and everything, and they made a lot, of, a lot of moves and some big moves. But I don't see where, you know, adding Tanev really made them all that much better. Um, I would have rather they had just kept Brody. But T Tanev's a guy that a lot of people are talking about is like, oh, nice move, you know, bring him in from the Canucks. But... He's 30 years old. He's got has an injury history, and I do I think he's a decent mid pair type D man, but he's not as good as a lot of people are making him out to be. And 
I, I just I think with same with a lot of Calgary's moves, I think they're a huge question mark going into this season. And uh, I, that Tanev move, I think, is it could go either way. And I don't think he's going to necessarily be the impactful player that a lot of people are thinking he's going to be. Uh, and I think you could say the same thing about Jacob Markstrom potentially as well, when the, who they gave a massive contract to. So yeah. um, I, I would say Tanev's a guy that a lot of people are talking about as this is being a great deal for Calgary. And I just I think he's a decent defenseman, but there's a lot of questions there. And I don't think he's going to be a, as good as people think. Yeah. Um, mine is some was going to be someone we already uh, mentioned just because of how high of a risk it was in Josh Anderson. But for mm-hmm. the sake of uh, avoiding that, I do think a trade I was a little surprised with because I think it definitely swings in the Avalanche's favor is that Zadorov and Lindholm oh, um, absolutely because Brandon Sod and Gilbert, um, and then they were able to also have some extra money i think after that to be able to keep burakoski for the two years 9.8 uh so that's a trade that i kind of went i guess the blackhawks think they can get the best out as a door off because that i mean that's um that's the only thing i can think there they have been good with defensemen obviously they got the best out of slater koku who's still in the free agency um Mm -hmm. so maybe they can but uh, that's one for me that was a little bit of a head scratcher. Like why, like you might as well keep the good locker room guys in until you find a better trade for them rather than just getting basically the door off um, for uh, trading Brandon Saad, who's definitely still a quality player. You know, he's amazing in the locker room from your cup win. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and then the other two guys are just swapping minor leaguers in Lindholm and uh, Gilbert. Yeah. Um, but that that was a surprise to me. That would be the one that I would pick just so I don't um, keep picking on Josh Anderson since I do like him as a player. It's just mm-hmm. it was a surprising signee for uh, the Canadians. But now we can move on to good signees, which uh, uh, Avalanche fans are also going to like this video because um, <laughs> Devin Tays getting traded to the Avalanche for where to go. Here we go. Um, to the Avalanche for a 2021 second round pick, a 2022 second round pick um, was a very good deal because giving up two seconds for De- Devontae's, uh, I always call him Devin for some reason, Devontae's is a, a really good move. This guy is a defenseman that really has started butting into his own just recently on the yeah. island and hasn't even hit his full prime yet. So you don't even know what you fully have in this guy when you're adding him to a team that has Timmons and a million other defensive prospects, yeah. plus one of the better defenses in the NHL already, they, they're just getting an embarrassment of riches yeah. uh, at the defensive position. And that's why I just think that's an amazing move. And the Colorado Avalanche are going to be a team to be reckoned with for a while because of all these just really smart sleuth moves you don't even expect them to make that they always keep making. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love the Taves move for Colorado. I love pretty much everything Colorado's done. Um, Joe Sackick's doing a masterful job there in building that team and in creating what I think is going to be a Stanley Cup favorite for the foreseeable future. Uh, For for me, a move that I really, really liked was TJ Brody going to the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. He he is a guy, good, really solid two-way player, um, an upgrade defensively over both Tyson Barry and Cody CC, who the Leafs let go. Uh, I agree with you uh, completely about Tyson Barry being much better in the Western Conference than in the um, in the East. I think he's better suited for the Western Conference style of play, and I think he's going to fit in really nicely in Edmonton. Um, he. He put up points with with Toronto, but he's such a defensive liability sometimes. That was not what Toronto needed on a team that already had defensive issues. Um, Brody Brody's a guy that is going to improve them defensively. He can also put up some points. His point totals had been dropping with the Flames the past couple of years, but I think he might kind of get rejuvenated a little bit going into this Maple Leafs lineup with so much firepower in it. Um 
Uh, and he's just a great veteran two-way guy to bring in. And on a team that, that really needed that and certainly needed an upgrade over Cody Ceci, um, to, to bring well, in a guy yeah, like... That's, <laughs> that's an understatement. Yeah. Um, but to bring in a guy like TJ Brody on a fairly good contract, he's making $5 million a year. Um, I, I like that move a lot for the Leafs, and I think the Leafs are going to be a better team this season than they were last year. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good upgrade because they definitely need more defensive-minded people for some mm -hmm. reason. I know uh, Pirlo would always joke about this. Uh, they always got people they didn't need. Uh, yeah. They got players that were good, but they just did not need that particular skill set. Mm -hmm. And they would always get those people for some reason. So uh, it's good now that it seems like they're paying attention to things they actually need uh before we move on to the free agent thing as our wrap-up topic i will say some things that happened today the jets hired dave lowry as an assistant uh coach and kendall coin schofield was named the player development coach for the chicago blackhawks so congratulations to both of them for getting new jobs and congratulations to schofield for getting a job in the nhl that I mean, I know we talked about this before the video, but I think that she mm -hmm. personally, from watching her on NHL Network and stuff, she seems like a mentor already. So player development seems like the perfect thing. And maybe this will go somewhere into having our first female coach um, a few years down the pipe uh, as we uh, get going uh, mm -hmm. five, seven years down the road, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, I just I just always thought uh, that um, she was someone that uh, should have been able to get into coaching, and I'm glad to see that that actually has come to fruition. And it's nice to see that the uh, NHL is really starting to come into the 21st century and really be good with all this stuff um, and making sure everybody is getting equal opportunity and all that. So I do like that about how the league is uh, trending now as well. Um, but to wrap up, we will have a free agent topic, which is a lot more interesting than the free agency ever is at this point of an off season, as you're coming pretty close to it. At center, you still have guys like Eric Holla, Carl Soderberg, and Derek Broussard, who have all been very solid players in their careers. Um, and then you have at wing, you obviously have Mike Hoffman, who's the cream of the crop. Everybody's yeah. still trying to figure out where that multi-goal scorer is going. And then Anthony Duclair, who's a very skilled player, but wants too much money. Um, yep. So we'll see what happens with him. Ante Tassio, who hasn't been able to figure things out. Uh, Kovalchuk, Gronlin, and Shiri would be the best uh, wingers uh, that you still have available and then uh, out of defensemen, your best guys would be Vaden and Hamannick, Chara, and I would say Bowie or Ben Hudden since Andy Green's like 38. Uh, but that's the order they listed it in. They put Andy Green first. Um, but who do you think for you, other than obviously Mike Hoffman's the top free agent, so if we take him out, who do you think's the top guy that you think a team should be going after that's still on the free agent? Oh man, then there's there's quite a few of these guys left that I'm just like, wow, they don't have jobs. That's unbelievable. But uh, Mikhail Granlin kind of sticks out for me because this is a guy who's had 60 plus point seasons with the Minnesota Wild. For uh, again, another guy coming out of Nashville, similar to Kyle Turris, who um, did not have a good tenure with Nashville. His offensive numbers really, really dropped, and that seems to be a common theme with players going to the Predators, unfortunately. Um, but man, he's, he's still, I think he's only like 28 or somewhere around there. It's not like he's a you know older player in his mid thirties or anything like that. The fact that he doesn't have a job in the NHL right now is wild to think about. Um, cause I think, you know, in the right situation and on the right team, I think his offensive production will, will go back up to at least, you know, around 50 points. He may never hit 60 again, but he'll at least be a solid mid lineup type guy around, you know, somewhere around 50 points. Um, and he's a skilled player who, who can score and pass too. You know, he can play make and put the puck in the net. So, um, I'm surprised to see Granlin still on the market at this point. I'm surprised to see a lot of these guys, not signed yet but man this flat cap is 
killing the free agent market because teams just don't have money to to bring these guys in. There, there are very few teams with any you know significant cap space right now, and um, the, the flat cap is really killing the free agent market for a lot of these guys. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's totally the uh, reasoning of the flat cap. My mm-hmm. guy is um, Sammy Vodnin yep. because when he went to Carolina, he started showing signs of his old self before he went to the Devils, where his play was really only bad on the Devils, which was a team that was kind of in shambles with locker room issues at times different thing, just a bunch of different nonsense going on the past couple of years with the Devils as they're trying to rebuild and get their team going out there. So I think going into a better situation, this is still a defenseman that can be productive for you. We know he can also put up points for you when needed and make the passes up the ice, but he's also mm-hmm. not a slouch in his best seasons uh, on defense. He's not a guy yeah. that's a liability on defense he's actually a pretty good two-way and I think he just got snuck into that struggle of the devils Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of guys not a lot of guys but a couple guys that didn't perform as well as they probably could have the last couple years in New Jersey and sometimes just struggling as a team plays into that in your whole psyche so I think going elsewhere for him will do him justice and he'll definitely be able to have a productive season and he's going to go to a good team. It's just someone's going to eventually figure out how to get money for them because he's too good of a player to just sit there. Same with guys like Hamannick. But uh, mm-hmm. it's just going to be interesting to see where he goes. Yeah, absolutely. And I I, I mean, I agree. Vatnin's a good NHL defenseman and certainly belongs in an NHL lineup. All of those guys that you mentioned at the start of this segment all belong in an NHL lineup somewhere. It's just... The, the salary cap thing, I think, is is really causing a lot of issues with, you know, teams just don't have the money to spend on these guys. When we get a when I think when teams get a better idea of where they're going to be able to bury money, like on LTIR and who they can whose cap hits they can get off the cap for next season with LTIR, that's you're going to see some more cap space open up. And then we're going to see some of these guys start to sign, I think, as we get closer towards the beginning of training camps. And we have a better idea of the injury situations with a lot of these guys as well. Yeah, I do think that's likely going to be the case as well as camps open. you see more guys sign. I think this year, due to um, people, certain teams not going for bigger guys that you can get for just one year for a couple million bucks because they don't want to give that couple million bucks. Mm-hmm. You're going to see the emergence of maybe the most surprise players this year. Excuse me, like meaning guys that you don't expect to put up as productive seasons, put up more productive seasons because they're just going to be given that opportunity since they had the ability to be signed for a cheaper contract. Like a Dominic Kahn, for example, who's mm-hmm. in uh, Edmonton now. Uh, he's a guy that you can get for cheap, but you know has some skill. He could be a surprise candidate that puts together a good, say, 40-point season or something. Yep. So that's uh, that's just one example there. So it'll be interesting to see a blessing in disguise, maybe a bunch of surprise people always try to look at the bright side of the equation, uh, show up this year in the league, uh, as some guys unfortunately have to wait for their contracts. Yeah, I agree. We definitely could see that, and I think – you're going to see a lot more guys in the lineup on cheaper contracts and they're going to have to, you know, fit, you know, those guys in. And I think we could see some really good seasons out of some more depth type players that you wouldn't necessarily expect it from completely agree. Yeah. Well, that is about, as a Pirlo would say, our full, uh, 42. Um, yes. And, uh, we're wrapping up here. Uh, I'm Joe Borick for Sports Fanatic News. You can follow me at JJ Borick 26 on Twitter. Uh, John, where can they get you at? Other than obviously the wonderful Off the Wall Hockey YouTube channel, definitely check him out there. I will put his uh, channel link in the uh, comments section and on the uh, video description. So check that out. But where can they find you uh, elsewhere if you want to share that? Yeah, I'm on Twitter as well as YouTube uh, at Off the Wall Hawk, just hockey without the EY at the end. And I'm on Facebook as well, just uh, facebook.com slash Off the Wall Hockey is the Off the Wall Hockey page on there. So 
Um, thanks for having me on, Joe. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, this was obviously a lot of fun. Always fun to talk hockey. And uh, yeah, definitely, uh, if you want to check out my channel, be sure to do that. As uh, got you know, pretty much daily hockey content coming your way. Yeah, it was a blast to have you on, man. Uh, we thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody have a great and safe, pleasant day. This has been the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Show with special guest John from Off the Wall Hockey. Peace out, everybody.